And uh, if you can open your Bibles to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, please. That's uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. So, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and I will begin in verse 14, when I've turned my mic on. Okay, so 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14. Be not un unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what agreement has Christ with Belial? Or what part has he that believes with an infidel? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. And I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says, says the Lord Almighty. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Let's just pray, shall we? Lord, we do thank you for your word this morning, that we can trust it, we can believe it, Lord. We thank you especially for Jesus, Lord, who is uh, the living word, Lord, and who has revealed you to us, Lord, has sanctified us, cleansed us, and saved us through the shedding of his blood. Lord, we do pray for this morning, Lord, that you will speak to us and work among, amongst us, Lord. We pray in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. So it begins in verse 14, 14 saying... Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers um, or uh, bound together with unbelievers. And this phrase, uh, to be unequally yoked together, comes from the Old Testament. And the, uh, the Israelites were prohibited to put two animals together that were, that were not alike, for example, an ox and a donkey, uh, because they're very different. They've got different sizes and strengths, uh, different gates. They're, they're all together. A different beast, if you might uh, pardon the pun. Um, and Paul is telling us that we shouldn't be yoked together. And a yoke, of course, is uh, something you'd put on animals to tie them together, that they might pull something, a plough, for example. We shouldn't be bound together unequally with unbelievers, essentially because we're not the same as the ox and the donkey is not the same. We're not the same as unbelievers, we're different. We've been made different, we weren't born different, we were born the same as them, weren't we? But God has made us different. Um, so we can't have the same fellowship with unbelievers that we might like. There might be lots of things that, that, that in many ways were similar. We might like the same football team. We might have similar ideas about the world or politics. Uh, lots of different things, but in the, in the key crucial difference which is Christ, we're very different. We can be friends with them, of course. We, uh, we can witness to them. We're commanded to witness to them. We need to witness to them because they need Jesus. But there's only so far we can go with them. And we need not to be influenced by them too much because they can um, pull us away from God. Um, of course, some of us are married to unbelievers, so uh, we, need to, um, we need to consider that. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 14, it says, The unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. And that's good, isn't it? Because no one wants unclean children. The wife is forever shouting at them to get in the shower and clean them up <laughs> but it says that two people who are married together one's a believer one's not a believer 
the, the husband is sanctified by the wife, the wife is sanctified by the husband, um, and the children are made clean. So that's a wonderful thing to know. Um, and sometimes people marry unbelievers, don't they? We've got few people here who have married unbelievers. And um, we need to pray for them that they get saved. And they need to continue in prayer. Uh, because it's, it's a very close bond, isn't it? There's few bonds closer in this world than marriage. And uh, when, you, when you get married, you, you know, you love someone, fall in love. You get married, you're going to find out all their faults. And they're going to find out all your faults very quickly, aren't they? You may think before you get married, oh, I haven't got any faults. But you get married and you find, oh, actually, there's quite a long list of, of faults wrong with me. <laughs> um, so that's, that's the reality of marriage, isn't it? And we're, we're warned not to be unequally yoked. And I, I don't think it's talking just about marriage. It's often applied to marriage. But I think it's talking also about uh, friendship, and, uh, and really uh, fellowship. And in 2 Peter 7 it says that God delivered righteous Lot vexed with the filthy conduct of the wicked for that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. So the question I have is how much can the righteous man influence the unrighteous with his righteousness? Will he make them more holy or will they make him less holy? Because um, Lot, although it says he was a righteous man and he, he lived where he lived, he didn't make them righteous, did he? The whole the entire city was destroyed and very few people saved out of it. So his righteous conduct didn't save them. It's only the blood of Jesus Christ, isn't it, that can save people. Um, we used to go around the village and we used to see a little old lady uh, who went to the Methodist church. She, she told me several times she went to the Methodist church that she was born a Methodist and she'd die a Methodist and she didn't agree with what we were doing going around the village telling people about Jesus because she told people about Jesus by her life and how she lived her life and we didn't need to be going out preaching the gospel to people and trying to witness to them. We should win them through our conduct but we can see through the scriptures that Lot was not that successful, was he, in his conduct by winning people to Christ. Unfortunately, even, even his wife turned back, didn't she, and was, and was turned into a, a pillar of salt. Um, so certainly we need to, to witness to unbelievers. We can still be friends with them and, and witness to them. In fact, that should be um, a key thing, shouldn't it? We can't leave them without a witness. But we can't be bound together with them in that sense and uh, there was a guy I used to work with he was a nice guy actually and uh, I think he was probably a believer he certainly uh, declared that he was um, but he was very fond of going to nightclubs he was in his 20s um, and he used to tell me that he would witness to people in nightclubs about Jesus which I was quite skeptical about and I didn't see the nightclub revival that perhaps he was hoping for and I think Possibly they influenced him more than he influenced them. Um, and there was certainly no fruit from it. And it says in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good morals or good habits. So there's a definite warning there, isn't there, that we need to be careful with the company that we keep. I've still got a lot of friends who are unsaved. And I still love them. We're still good friends. But there's a difference there now. And, and I think we both recognize it that I've, I'm not the person I was. They're still the same. And I can see that, you know, there's, there's part of us when we get saved is still the same, isn't there? We're still fundamentally the same person we are. But our status has been changed. We've, we've come out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And very often that chase with people, doesn't it? Our family don't look at us the same way. I know my, when I was an unbeliever, my relationship with my sister was much better than it is now. Sad, uh, sad to say, um, because there's something within her that just jars. And she, she looks at me very skeptically, I think, because she knows the type of person I was before. And I guess she probably thinks I'm putting on an act, which I'm not. I've been changed from within, and I, I can't help it. <laughs> 
not that I, I uh, come across, uh, you know, high and mighty and holier than thou. It's just that I've, I've been changed. It wasn't me. I didn't do it. I'm not really responsible for it. So I can't take the, uh, the credit for it. And uh, Paul poses a question, what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And uh, righteousness and lawlessness can only go so far together, can't it? It says in the scriptures, how can two walk together unless they be agreed? There's a difference there, isn't there? And what communion has light with darkness? That's a, that's a strange, um, strange way to put it, isn't it? I, I wouldn't put it that way. If you, if you think of the world, the world is often dualist, dualistic with light and dark coexisting together. And many belief systems would tell us that that's necessary. You can't have light without dark. But the reality is when you turn a bright light on, darkness is gone. Darkness flees. Dar darkness cannot exist with light. The, the two cannot coexist. We're going to see this when the Lord returns and we see the brightness of his coming. The darkness will be gone. The, the darkness that exists will be hiding in the caves and hiding and saying, ha f rocks fall on us and hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. The two can't exist. O oil and water, you can mix them up to a degree, can't you? And if you make a balsamic glaze or whatever, you can mix them up a bit. It's hard work, but it does work to a degree. But light and dark, you turn a bright light on, the darkness is gone. It cannot exist. And that's why um, when we look at it in those terms, the fellowship of believers is so precious, isn't it? Because the, the friends that we've got in the world who are unbelievers, we may love them dearly, but something jars, doesn't it? Something is not the same. We can't have that, that deep fellowship because they don't believe in Jesus. I remember when I got saved I, and all the great people in the world, I, Thought, well, what's this guy believe in Jesus? What's this guy say about Jesus? And they may be very highly intelligent, very moral and decent people with great ideas, fantastic ideas. But what you believe about Jesus changes you and you must make a decision one way or the other. Are you going to be against him or are you going to be for him? If you're for him, you'll be born again, you'll be changed and you'll be fundamentally different. But it says in there, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He says that he's writing to those who have got like precious faith. They've got precious faith like what we've got. Um, and whatever differences we may have in the church, uh, what unites the believer is bigger than what divides. There are minor doctrinal differences here and there. But the reality is, Christ died for this, this side, people on this side of the room as much as he did onto this side of the room. And we've been changed. We're now brothers and sisters. We now have the same Father because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. We've been bought by his precious blood. And we now have a, a precious faith which is similar, we may have the odd difference here and there. But in the grand scheme of things, because Jesus has died for us, he's bought us with his blood, we're bound together and we can now have fellowship. We're, before we were darkness, now we're light. And there's that fundamental change in reality and uh, in, in our lives and in our hearts, that light has been shed into our hearts and we've been changed. And that is something to unite over, isn't it? There's people trying to unite the world over all various types of things, holding hands and waving flags at the Olympics and, and all the, uh, the opening ceremonies, but that won't work. It might work for a short time, but it won't work for long. And when the Lord returns, this fake fellowship will disappear and the real fellowship of believers will be made manifest. And that's something, not just something to unite, unite over, that's something eternal, isn't it? That's something that's not just fleeting in the here and now. We've been bought and we've been brought into the kingdom of light, which is going to last forever. So 
So it's uh, an eternal fellowship. But on the flip side, there are many things, and probably a growing list of things that we can't have fellowship with. <coughs> I've got on my, um, on number one on my list as a former Roman Catholic, Rome. No fellowship with Rome, sorry. I, I've been there and done that as a, as a, as a youngster. And um, I, I side with the reformers who looked at Revelation 17 and said, this is Rome. I think it's probably slightly more than Rome, I have to say. But I, th I do think that city is Rome in Revelation 17. I think it's combined with other things, the New Age, Freemasonry. It will probably be united in the end times with UFOs and a fake alien invasions and stuff like this. Reality, demonic invasions. They're already preparing plans and saying they baptize UFOs, aliens, which we know are demonic. And if they have an, another, a new revelation to bring to us which supersedes ours, then they would, would look into that and take it on board. So there's no fellowship with Rome. If we look at um, you know, some of the crusades they fought against Christians and the counter-reformation, how they fought against the reformation and s sought to subvert the church and destroy the foundations of the church, there could be no fellowship with Rome. That's my first one. We've got Islam. These days we've got Chrislam, haven't we? Where the people are trying to blend and join together Christianity and Islam, which will, of course will feed into the world religion that we know is coming. And that's fine. We can have fellowship with Islam as long as we deny the deity of Christ, the Trinity, the resurrection, which is essentially the, the core aspects and doctrines of the faith, isn't it? So as long as you deny the fundamental doctrines of the faith, you can have fellowship with Islam. Is anyone up for that? Because I, I'm not. Um, I'm, I'm going to stick by Jesus Christ because, because he is God. And he is part of the triune God. And he was resurrected. He died and was re resurrected again for our, our, our salvation. So there's no way that I will ever turn my back on that. Of course, Freemasonry, we can't have any fellowship with that, which is essentially the ancient mystery schools and the worship of the sun, which is the light bearer, which when you look into it is Lucifer, as, as uh, Albert Pike tells us in Morals and Dogma. Um, and this stuff's everywhere. They backed uh, churches together a few years ago. I took a picture of it saying that they were, they were backing churches together, uh, which is a scary thing. The churches should know this churches should be aware of this this has been written about for hundreds of years we should re really be very aware of this um, we've got gnosticism which is, has never gone away in fact it's becoming more and more popular it's a, a key part of the uh, the new age it's, if anyone's interested in that they can watch a, a, a movie called dualism the illuminati religion I hope that uh, the I word there doesn't get us struck from YouTube. But, um, and this guy talks about how, uh, how these people are putting these, uh, these Gnostic doctrines into lots of movies, which I had never considered, to be honest, until I saw this. But when I saw it, I thought, wow, that's genius. The fact that they've done this and people don't know, people don't realize. And they watch these movies. Many of them, I'd seen them myself and I, and I never realized. And, um, and I think God has revealed to this guy what is going on. And it basically, you'll see it in Star Wars, you'll see it in, uh, sorry, Mike, uh, Lego the movie, <laughs> uh, Lego the movie, which is a kid's film, and, um, and The Matrix. It's all based on Gnostic doctrines of uh, having an evil God who created the world, is what they believe. That's, that's God. And... and um, and there's two gods essentially, and, and lightness and dark and light coexist and blend together, and that's that's everywhere. That's what we're seeing now. We're seeing it with the new age and um, this theory of a coming enlightenment, which is going to take humanity then to the next level, a, a fifth dimension, and all this sort of stuff. We see it everywhere. Um, um, it, there's probably not a day goes past when you don't see this uh, this sort of stuff. David Icke has talked about this for years, and uh, I, I, I'm in a channel on Telegram, 
I keep getting these people posting stuff that they believe they're getting this information from the, the Pleiades, is it? This sort of stuff. Aliens are communicating with them and giving them all this special knowledge. And that's, that's the kind of thing we see everywhere. But I, I, I don't dispute that they are getting special knowledge, but I just dispute the source. I think it's demonic. Um, let's look quickly at uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 3. Right, 1 John chapter 4, verse 3. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now is already in the world. Well, this is, uh, this is a scripture that I believe is, is uh, written against Gnosticism to warn people, because the Gnostics believed uh, that essentially spirit was uh, spirit was good and matter was evil therefore they concluded that jesus christ didn't have a physical body and god has written this scripture saying uh, every spirit that confesses not jesus christ is covered in the flesh is not of god that is against gnosticism unfortunately some of that is not in the modern bibles a lot of the new bibles say every spirit that confesses not jesus christ but the traditional text says every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is not a translation issue. This is why I, I lean towards the King James and New King James because we've got two essentially fundamentally different manuscript traditions. We've got on the one hand the traditional text which was received by the church and then we've got the critical I mean historically so that was the historic text for thousands of thousands of years basically and then we've got the critical text which is from west cotton hall who were really frankly heretics and unbelievers and they have come up with this new text incorporating from e text from egypt largely based on two texts whereas the historical text is based on five thousand and says that jesus christ has come in the flesh the new texts have taken that out because it's, it's been corrupted by Gnostics from Alexandria. So this is a problem really with, with, uh, with new, new versions. Uh, some of them have got it, but a lot of them don't have it. I think the, the ESV is one of them that, that doesn't have it now. Um, because all the spirits acknowledge Jesus. The Jehovah's Witnesses acknowledge Jesus, but they've got a different Jesus. They've got a Jesus who, when he was resurrected, didn't have a physical body because that's that Gnosticism. So we need to be on guard against Gnosticism and that's why God gave us this scripture and that's why we need that scripture in our Bibles. Okay, and, and we, know, um, we know this was in the Bible. The, the, the new text that they've discovered that they say go back to the 1400s which I, I don't believe is true, but that is another story. We know that Irenaeus quoted this in the 100s. So that's 300 years before the new texts, supposedly. So we know that this was in the text originally, and it should be there. Um, so we've got the things that we can't have fellowship with, Rome, Islam, Freemasonry, Gnosticism, and also the world. Um, James 4.4 4 says, Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore makes himself a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. That's shocking, isn't it? You think, you know, God so loved the world that he gave his own only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So we, God loves the world, but it's, it says that we're not to love the world. We're not to have friendship with the world in that way that we're not to be bound up with it and changed by it and to to be conformed to the world we're to be conformed to the image of christ aren't we we need to be more like jesus and less like the world um, and we look at the uh, the protests this week which are shocking and, and sadly take away from uh, the tragic events the three little girls that have lost their lives and now these protests have become bigger than the fact that these three little girls 
of being tragically killed. And um, 1 Peter 4 says, they think it's strange that you don't run with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. That's in the King James. Other, other versions say, uh, you know, over, uh, over enthusiasm, that kind of thing, excess of um, sin, if you like. But the, the King James actually re- renders it excess of riot, and that's what we've got this week, isn't it? It's lack of self-control. We need to be self-controlled. They, they have got a lack of self-control and have gone smashing about, gone about smashing stuff up because um, they don't like what's happening. But unfortunately, these things, the, the mass immigration, Islamification, are signs of the times, aren't we? We know that our country is going downhill rapidly, and it's not just our country, it's, it's around the world. It's, it's the signs of the times that things are getting worse. We are beginning to see the, be, uh, the beginnings of birth pangs, aren't we? That we know nation is going to rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There are going to be famines and wars and pestilences. And this is the unfortunate beginnings of this. I think, um, I think there's a lot of silly people have got caught up in this. I think other people are trying, trying to cause trouble deliberately. We've probably got far, foreign powers stirring up problems in our country. But we need to be separate from that. We can't, we can't go along with that, can we? We may go and witness to people. But you see, um, problems like that, it says, it says in Exodus, doesn't it? Don't, don't run with a crowd to cause trouble, essentially, that kind of thing. That Don't get caught up in a mob causing trouble. Whenever you see that trouble like that, you've got to get out of there because the trouble is going to come. Um, so back to Corinthians. Um, verse 15, it says, What concord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has he that believes with an unbeliever? So there's no agreement there, is there? God is telling us, what, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? And essentially none. The two things need to be separate, don't they? Um, and verse, verse 17 says, Therefore, come out from among them and be separate. In other words, don't be like the world. Although we may have concerns over, over mass immigration and people coming in on boats, we, we need to do things peacefully, don't we? Uh, how many of the people smashing things up this week voted? I would guess probably none of them. Very few. And now they've gone out to smash things up. Why didn't you vote for someone who was going to actually bring some uh, change or at least put a break on this thing? Um, so we're not called to be like them. We're called to be different. Um, we're called to be holy, aren't we? which means essentially to be set apart for God. We're not called to be like the world. We're called to be like Jesus and to be holy and set apart for him. Um, and this, in verse 17, it says, Come out, be separate. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Uh, and further down, it talks about God's promises. Um, so we have a God who promises. Um, as Mike said before, we don't have a God who's, who's distant and far away and you know ethereal and and not real, but a God who who is real and close, and a God who promises, a God who keeps His promises. Um, we're told in the Quran that Allah is the greatest of all deceivers, but in the Bible it says that it's impossible that God should lie. Impossible. It's not possible that God should lie. And he has made all these promises. It says in Ephesians 1 verse 6, he has made us accepted in the beloved. We're accepted in the beloved because of Jesus Christ, what he's done, that he's made all these promises. Verse 17, it says, uh, come out, be separate. I will receive you. That if we come out from the world, put our trust in Jesus, God receives us. That God welcomes us into his family, into his bosom, which is an amazing thing. 
And in Ephesians 3, verse 12, it says, we have boldness and access with confidence by faith in him. We're not just forgiven. We're not just put on a shelf. We're welcomed into the family of God. We're, we're given access with confidence and boldness so that God is, is no longer angry with us. He's no longer has a score to settle with us. He no longer has a list of sins that we've committed against us. But he's welcomed us into his family and he's preparing a place for us. Verse, verse 18, it says, I will be a father unto you. So it's not just forgiveness. It's, it's adoption. It's welcoming into the family of God. And uh, 1 John 3 tells us, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. So there's a change, isn't there? That God has not just forgiven us, but he's showered love upon us. He's bestowed love upon us. He's, he's, he's poured his love upon us because of what Jesus has done. And because of that, our status has changed. We're now forgiven. We're now family. We're now the family of God. And because of that, we're called to be holy, aren't we? It says uh, in, in verse 1 of the next chapter, having therefore these promises. So that's a key thing, isn't it? That God has promised all these things, that he will receive us. We will be sons and daughters. He will be our father. And in light of that, Paul is saying, having therefore these promises. So that's a key thing, isn't it? That we can hold on to God's promises. And no matter what, we're, what troubles we're going through in our life, we can and we should, and let's face it, we, we need to hold on to God's promises. And remember, always remember, it's impossible that God should lie. <clears throat> so because we've got these promises, it says, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh, perfecting holiness, filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So we need to cleanse ourselves, don't we? We need to cleanse ourselves. It says perfecting holiness, that we should be perfect in holiness. Essentially, that's, that's not easy to achieve, is it? It's a difficult thing. But that's our, that's our goal, isn't it? That should be our, our target, to perfect holiness. It says, in the fear of God. Now, we're, we're told elsewhere in the scriptures, aren't we? The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. It's pure. It endures forever. And that's the key, isn't it? We see uh, these people now going out rioting. They don't fear God, do they? We, we see the three, three men crucified. One of them said to the other one, do you not fear God? He was mocking Jesus. He said, do you not fear God? And these people now rioting, they don't, they don't fear God. It's better for us to, to fear God and uh, perfect righteousness and holiness. It says that is pure and it endures forever. So, so we are called uh, to work out, aren't we, how we're meant to be in the world but not of it. We're, we live here, but we're not to be entangled with it. You know, we're, we're caused to dwell here, but not be changed by it. We're, caused to change, we're called to change the world, aren't we? That's our, our calling, our mission, uh, or at least some small part of it and the people in it. Uh, 1 John 4 verse 4 says, Whoever is born of God overcomes the world. Um, so we're called to be overcomers, aren't we? And we may not feel like it when we drag ourselves out of bed in the morning. You know, your back might be hurting, you might get cramp getting yourself out of bed. But we need to remember that we're overcomers, not because of us, but because of Jesus Christ and what he's done. And it says in uh, uh, 2 Timothy 2, uh, verse 4, No man that goes to war entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who has chosen him. And that's what I think we're, we are called to do now. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus, don't we? 
the world is going crazy. The world is going to go a lot crazier, believe me. But we've got to keep our eyes on Jesus, not entangle ourselves in the affairs of this life, not be wrapped up in it, not be changed by it, because our status is, is set, it's secure. We are righteous and holy because Jesus has died for us and he's told us that we are. And if we don't feel like it, we need to bring our thoughts into captivity to his word and we need to align our thoughts with with his thoughts and not dwell on the world because it's passing away isn't it it says don't love the world for the 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 love of the world the world is passing away but he who does the, the will of god endures forever if we do the will of god we live forever don't we because he has bought us he's changed us and he has overcome the world. He's overcome death and hell and sin. He's coming soon to redeem us. And all of this, which looks so terrible now, we're not even going to remember it for the joy that's before us. But for now, we, we need to keep on, don't we? Draw near to Jesus. Sometimes we pray, Lord, draw near to me. But it says in the word, draw near to him and he will draw near to you. So the onus is on us that we need to draw near to the Lord and not entangle ourselves with the, world, with the world, but draw near to him. And we need to get close to God and trust in him and rely on him. So I bless you. Amen.